Most of all, I pray that our time together will be useful uh, to building up God's work among us here in the West Ohio Conference and being uh, a part of the pathway uh, to healing and uh, renewal and uh, redemption. Um, I want to move in about three segments today, and then we'll get to the questions. Uh, the first is I'd like to offer a passage of scripture, and I'm offering it not because it's an answer, but because I have found it to be one that has steadied me, particularly this, this week. And uh, as you listen to it, you may find usefulness in it, and all of us need to find our, our praying ground and the scriptural foundations that sustain us and give us a sense of anchoring when we feel buffeted by, by the storm, so to speak. Secondly, I'll move through a, a pretty quick summary of uh, what indeed was legislated uh, at uh, the general conference uh, that concluded on Tuesday evening of this week. And then I will move into the category of opinion. Uh, so I'm going to offer a few opinions and uh, some observations. They'll kind of be mixed together. And then uh, one or two suggestions about ways that we might specifically move forward. I don't have any illusion that that section is exhaustive. And there are lots of good ideas. And if you happen to be somebody that works closely with me on the staff, um, the superintendents know that it's my conviction that great ideas come uh, from, from all over the place. But um, also, I should have a few good ideas too, every now and again. And, um, and then we see which are the best ones to use at a particular time. So it doesn't have to be my idea or my way of moving, moving forward. The reading is from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, and I'm reading from the eighth chapter. I want to um, have you be very clear about that. And it's two selected passages, first beginning at the, um, um, uh, in the 18th verse, and then picking up again around the 31st verse. Hear what the apostle says to the church and to the churches. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with patience. And then picking up in the 31st verse, what then shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God, whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, 
nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I hope you can conclude in your own mind why I have found those verses steadying. So two words, one, this image that something new is being born. And out of new birth, we know that what accompanies it are the pangs and the pains that accompany new birth. And secondly, the assurance that comes at the end of the eighth chapter, that there is nothing in all the earth, nor in the cosmos, that can separate us, can separate any, any one of us as individuals or the church from God's love that has been disclosed to us in the life, the death, and the blessed resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I want to turn, as I promised, to the specific actions of the General Conference, which was called by the Council of Bishops uh, to receive uh, the report um, uh, that was coming through the work of the Commission on a Way Forward to see if uh, we could find a way forward as a denomination uh, out of the uh, sense of malaise of an almost 50 year pretty intense and divisive conversation about the right relationship of church and human sexuality, the Christian faith, and uh, persons of all sorts of uh, sexual preferences, identities, gender identity, etc. And so that's been somewhat at the heart of our life uh, for a number of decades now. And uh, the delegates and the bishops at the last general conference in Portland wanted to see if we could make, um, find a way forward that we could be and do church together, be so focused on the mission. The result of that, um, there are differing views uh, about the outcomes of that, but I want you to hear a brief and quick litany of the things that were concluded with a little information that helps you to contextualize it. One, all legislation that was approved and does uh, appear to be constitutional, meaning it's not been challenged to the Judicial Council, takes effect January 1 of 2020. So at this moment, we are under our current Book of Discipline, the 2016 Discipline, and these changes which will amend the discipline become effective in January. Um, secondly, uh, the timeline for the effective date is a little longer for the annual conferences that are a part of the central conferences. And the central conferences are the large regional bodies of United Methodists from several annual conferences outside of the United States. So in the United States, we refer to annual conferences and five geographic jurisdictions. So for us in West Ohio, we're in the north central jurisdiction. But for example, um, Congo, which has four Episcopal areas, it is itself also a central conference made up of a number of annual conferences. And the tr same would be true, the Philippines is a central conference, the Germany is its own central conference with multiple annual conferences, and then there are several other I others in Europe and Eurasia. So their timeline for implementation is a little bit beyond uh, January because of the need for language translation and then application in those contexts. Several petitions were passed by uh, the General Conference that were quickly dispatched to the Judicial Council asking for a ruling on their constitutionality. Some of those rulings have come back already and it had an effect on what will go into effect and some of them just because of the limits of time will not be able to be taken up by the Judicial Council until their April meeting. So the Judicial Council uh, usually meets on a rhythm of about twice a year. Sometimes they have a special session. They did that 
that. They came to St. Louis before the General Conference, stayed throughout the General Conference. Keep in mind that the members of the Judicial Council are volunteers. So it's like being on a board or a committee in the annual conference. This is not, we refer to them sort of uh, proverbially as the church's Supreme Court, but it is not their day job. All of those people, lay and clergy, they, they have other jobs that they do. So this is uh, pretty extensive volunteer work they do. So they have to get back home and they'll pick up, a, pick up the docket in April. Um, and so two of the petitions that were passed and, and found to have no constitutional uh, challenges were um, uh, petitions that were submitted by Westpath, and Westpath formally was referred to as um, the Board of Pensions and Health Benefits of the denomination. And the uh, basic import of those petitions was to um, shore up and um, uh, undergird the idea that um, if there is a runoff of church churches or of giving, um, that the obligations that we have uh, to people that are pensioners, whether or not they're retired clergy, lay workers in the church, or they're um, those who have inherited uh, from them, that uh, those promises would be kept. And a lot of that is governed, as you might imagine, by federal law, uh, et cetera. So those petitions uh, roughly hewn, uh, ensure um, that as if churches should exit, that that they would um, uh, take care of the obligations based upon formulas that um, exist or would be developed to make sure that we do not fail as a church in keeping our promises to any of our retired clergy, lay workers, or their, their spouses or descendants that may be the beneficiaries. In fact, in this room, I see some retired clergy uh, of this annual conference. And so that's important that we keep faith, uh, keep faith with them. Uh, another petition that passed and was found constitutional was uh, a clarifying definition of a self-avowed practicing homosexual. Um, the definition was added to to include persons living in same-sex marriages, domestic partnership, or in civil unions, or a person who publicly states that they are a practicing homosexual. Um, an additional petition that was approved and found to be constitutional um, was focused on Episcopal leadership, that would be on bishops, and uh, it is a prohibition that no bishop of our church uh, should consecrate a homosexual bishop even if duly elected in their respective jurisdiction or central conference, and that anyone that the board of ordained ministry of an annual conference should determine is a self-avowed practicing homosexual, the bishop is prohibited from ordaining that person. Next, uh, the composition of the Board of Ordained Ministry. Um, the bishop must certify that all persons that are nominated to an annual conference board of ordained ministry will uphold the book of discipline in its entirety. This, this petition passed. It has been sent to the Judicial Council and they will make a, a ruling on it and in their April meeting. So it, there are enough questions in enough people's minds, including the bishops of the church, as to the constitutionality uh, of that that we're asking for a ruling from the high court. For, for clergy who conduct same-sex weddings, um, a minima and are convicted of the same in a church trial, which nobody wants, um, a minimum penalty has uh, been instituted um, that there would be a one-year suspension of that clergy person and that if there is a second offense that um, their ministry uh, as an ordained or licensed person would be terminated. Qualifications for ministry were another subject and this has to do with the district committees on ordained ministry the board, the conference boards of ordained ministry, and uh, it states roughly that they shall not approve or recommend any candidate who does not meet the qualifications for ministry after a full examination of them. And the bishop shall rule out of order any such recommendation of a candidate who is so unqualified. 
In the complaint process, there were a number of petitions that passed and uh, have not been questioned uh, judicially. Uh, one is that the bishop, um, should this go into effect in January, can only dismiss a complaint if it has no basis in law and the reason for the dismissal is shared with the complainant. I would say that previously bishops have had some uh, discretion uh, on the management of uh, complaints, not the discretion to ignore it, but some discretion about how to um, engage people in ways that would bring healing. The just resolution process, which is the goal of the complaint process to reach a just resolution in which pe people experience um, a healing from the harm that has been done, must state identified harms and how they will be addressed um, to the complainant so that the complainant, the person lodging a complaint against a person and a clergy person in particular, um, will have um, more say, uh, so to speak, um, uh, at the time in which the just resolution is reached. Every effort should be made, um, um, there was legislation that says um, that a just resolution would be agreed to by the complainant. Also that uh, in the process of the, the complaint process, that counsel for the church, that is um, the person representing the church in the complaint process can appeal um, decisions uh, based upon quote, egregious errors of law. And finally, this petition, um, there were um, multiple petitions uh, to the General Conference about disaffiliation, or you may have seen the word disassociation, i.e., how can a church disconnect from the United Methodist Church, a local church? Uh, one of those um, that um, uh, the delegates dealt with uh, ultimately adopted um, a, um, by a uh, small margin um, um, is in, will go to the Judicial Council uh, in April, and it does outline a process to be followed um, across the church, um, particularly here in the United States, for how that church may disconnect. So one of the things I would encourage for you, uh, uh, encourage um, you to, is to watch um, both continuing interpretation of the actions of the General Conference and also uh, to be alert to the rulings that will come uh, in late April from the Judicial Council. Now, as promised, I wanna move um, to make a few observations and uh, do a bit of opining and hopefully um, not, not depress you in the process. I do wanna say that um, you have to be living somewhere else other than on planet Earth, not to take in that there is deep pain and alienation in the United Methodist Church. There was already a wound over this 50 year long, almost 50 year long discussion. In my opinion, and I'm owning it as an opinion, that wound is even deeper. It is for the whole body, but it is particularly so for parts of the body and particularly those parts of the body um, that identify and understand themselves to be LGBTQ persons. So I wanna say that without apology and uh, without a lot of uh, underscoring of it, people are in pain. Um, if you're not a part of the LGBT uh, community, you don't identify in that way and may not have even identified yourself in a particular way as, as an ally, there are people in that sector that are also in deep pain because they see the woundedness of others. And our biblical teaching, um, any of the texts on the, the body, uh, talk about uh, ways in which if a part of the body is hurting, um, the whole body is hurting. That should not draw less attention to the part or parts that are hurting, but it should remind us that injury in church is in one sense an injury uh, to the whole, uh, even though it may start with specific individuals who feel, it, who feel it poignantly. Many persons yearned for this general conference to be a way that would move us forward 
with both healing and hope, healing for past hurts, and hope for ways in which we would continue to be linked in mission and in ministry and begin to live into an, a vision that was inclusive and embracing of the gifts uh, for ministry of all persons without regard to sexual orientation and gender identity. There are more people than ever, this is my second observation, who are part of the church and some who do not identify with church as a faith community, who believe that the UMC is now the church of exclusion and of no, capital letters, N-O. This is especially true, I have found, at least anecdotally, among younger people, among unchurched people, and among de-churched people. Please, if you are not in the category of young, however you define that, um, I'm not suggesting that you might not share in that as well. But there are many people feeling um, that uh, we have now moved toward being more exclusive. Um, and uh, while there are other people who feel that we've moved toward being more clear and in their opinion, more faithful. For some people, it feels like, this is observation number three, that we have taken an additional step or steps to organize our life as the United Methodist Church around a very narrow slice of biblical writing and Christian tradition. And we have defined holiness so narrowly that it calls into question whether or not any other aspect of human life actually matters. I just want to hit pause there. In the near term, observation number four, the decisions of the recent general conference have put additional stress on relationships with many of the church-affiliated institutions and ministry that were birthed from the church. These are institutions of higher education. Uh, these are institutions of health and wholeness and wellness, whether or not they are hospitals, whether or not they are clinics, whether or not they um, are care for children or elder care institutions. This has added to a stress and a potential, I'm not a, not a prophet, but a potential unhealthy distancing um, of those uh, institutions from um, the United Methodist Church. While I am quick to say to you all that there were no petitions that passed the General Conference that specifically spoke to or directed any institution that is affiliated with us to do anything about how they live the life, their life in that institution. And that should be underscored. Those, all of those institutions are separately incorporated and um, have certain freedoms that accompany, accompany that. I have come to learn in the last 24 hours that institutions in local communities that have previously shown gracious and generous preference sometimes, and this is particularly true in small communities, to churches, have already indicated to some United Methodist churches that that generosity will no longer be extended to them. Illustration, small town paper somewhere here in West Ohio that previously would put in um, ads for local church events in that small town paper said to one of our, our churches, uh, we will not any longer advertise for free any of your events because you're a part of a discriminatory institution. So this is a fact, that's not an opining. Whether or not that becomes widespread, that's another story, I'm not prophesying that. I am saying that there are real effects in real time. It's reported to me that admissions staff of some of our institutions of theological education uh, have already, as they gone to campuses, had students not even stop at our table 
uh, meaning their table, uh, to pick up a brochure. Because, and of course, it happened that these kind of uh, theological seminary fairs were going on at the same time as General Conference. So it was prominent in people's, in people's minds. May I say, it could be, though I hope not, that we have added additional stress to some of our ecumenical relationships. I pray that the depth of those relationships uh, will, will continue. And uh, I have experienced from colleagues, particularly uh, in the Episcopal Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, nothing but support, prayer, and encouragement, and the reminders that we will, as United Methodists, get through this um, in, in due season. So we are suffering through a great period now of pain and some blaming, and it is greatly in question whether or not we will cease from attacking and demonizing one another and find ways to turn toward one another. And so a few suggestions as we move forward, more specificity to be added uh, later. Let us, first of all, West Ohio, Remember our mission as United Methodists, which is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world and to join through our work in God's mission and God's dream that this world might be more loving, more humane, more just, and that it might be filled more with people who are shaped in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Let me say that another way. This current challenge that we are facing is not a hall pass for us to avoid essential and core missional questions. God has not said to us, in my opinion, well, when you guys sort this out, you can get back to the mission. This is the kind of thing, and we all live with imperfections in our personal lives. You keep on trucking. <laughs> You keep on moving. You keep doing life, even if you've made mistakes, and you try to keep improving as you move along. This is an instance where we will continue to build the bridge that, that we are walking on. But we have not been freed from the mission. There are many people in this world, in our local communities, and while some of them are clued in to the headlines that have um, been out there about the United Methodist Church this week, their hunger is for something different, and it won't necessarily be their presenting issue. Are we to turn them away because we are so preoccupied with this discussion? I say no. We just have to own that we have pain, we're broken, we're not perfect, but we are a people in process. Secondly, we are going through an understandable season of lament, and we should. Whenever there's pain, we should lament that. We should, um, all of our sense of sympathy and empathy should rise to the fore, that we might stand together in anguish and in tears, um, um, but in the midst of that, it occurs to me, um, this word um, in the New Testament, that we also have to be prepared to speak our hopes. So we cannot become univocal in the sense that we only have one narrative. We must say that we have some pain, if that's your reality. And we must also say that our hope is ultimately in the triune God, in the gospel of our Lord in Jesus Christ, and in our sense of trust in God's forever love for each one of us. If it is not, we have no hope anyway. Thirdly, I want to invite us to be intentional, and I don't have a scheme to offer you today, about moving toward one another. A sign of this would be for each of us and all of us to become a committee of one that moves toward other people, particularly the hurting, and not assuming that because somebody looks like they're okay that they may not be in pain as a United Methodist, and to move toward people and leap over the boundaries of our personal feelings, convictions, and our tribal loyalties. We've got to go 
and be in relationship with people that we don't agree with. Can, can I underscore and say that we may not even like? I mean, Jesus talked about this, did he not, in the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, what do you do more than others if you extend a dinner invitation to people that have extended one to you? So the example of Jesus is always moving out where you would not by instinct necessarily go. I invite us all to some fresh Bible and theological engagement and I hope by annual conference time, I will have a plan to unfurl across West Ohio. Those that engage it will engage it, and those that don't, don't. And that would be, first of all, a deep study across this annual conference in the book of Galatians. And secondly, a deep study across the West Ohio annual conference in a plain account of Christian perfection uh, of Mr. Wesley. And uh, there's already, there are already replete resources in our denomination. Um, the one that I love the most is called A Perfect Love um, and um, is already ready for study. But we may work with some of the resident uh, Bible scholars and theologians from the two seminaries in Ohio to assist us in sort of right-sizing conversations around Bible and this part of our tradition as Wesleyan people here in, in Ohio. Once again, thanks for being here today, and uh, I'm now ready to be open to your questions. If I don't know the answer, you will hear a speedy, I do not know. Bishop, we have received over 200 questions already, so they are, they are streaming in. One is uh, related to ministry in the local church. How does the outcome of General Conference affect the ministry of our local churches, and how can I as a pastor best lead forward? I think I offered a couple of suggestions at the end, um, but, but let me say everything begins um, not with doctrine but with relationship. Uh, and so I think for those who lead congregations as pastors and staff, I hope that none of you, whether you're ordained staff or uh, lay staff, will think too smallly of the work that you do uh, on an everyday basis to enrich the lives of people in your congregations and your communities with, um, with the love of, of the gospel. So nothing changes about the call of a pastor, for example, to engage in pastoral care. Um, those who preach should keep preaching um, and uh, do so with, uh, with gusto and with sensitivity. I do think that local churches uh, may need to be more attentive than ever to the people that are living at the margins. In this season, we, there's a particular focus uh, that I think is w more than worthy of our attention uh, around those who um, identify as LGBTQ in our churches and in our communities. And I want to underscore, these are not people outside of our churches only. These are people in our congregations. They're already a part of our family. But I would beg of everyone not to define the margins or those who are marginalized by any narrow definition. Bishop, can you say a word about the difference of the vote at General Conference between the U.S. delegations and those Central Conference delegations? Um, I think there's been an assumption um, that um, people from uh, large parts of the Central Conferences, though not exclusively, um, um, tended to go more with uh, the so-called traditional um, uh, kind plan or legislation that was symbolic of the traditional plan, which is uh, the outcome we got. Um, there is no doubt that lots of folks um, among the U.S. delegates um, also were voting uh, in, that, in that direction. Uh, based upon things that they said at the microphone. I mean, there's no tally from the, um, the, the voting tools that keeps up with, you know, how an individual uh, voted, meaning by, by name. Um, but I am confident that there are people all across the globe, wherever there are United Methodists who were delegates, um, that voted in each direction, uh, so to speak. But my hunch is that it was more, um, that there was a higher percentage among folks from some of the central conferences. 
What I can say is that when we were in our Council of Bishops meeting on Wednesday, that the pain among the bishops in the Central Conferences um, is um, equally as stark as it is among the U.S. bishops. And, um, you know, you can only claim to know what you actually know. And, um, and that's where earlier I said, we, I believe we're called, um, we're, we, we ought to receive the data that we can know. We should also resist uh, the tendency to blaming uh, because that will force us more deeply into our caves. Bishop, how much does a church trial cost and who pays for it? Church trials, um, should a complaint get to that, um, um, that end, um, happen within annual conferences. So let me answer the um, second part first, uh, that it becomes an expense and a cost uh, mostly within an annual conference, almost exclusively. Um, I have heard a range um, that has gone from um, about 30,000 and some church trials that have gone um, 60,000 and more. And that's a single trial for, for a single clergy person. Um, and, and I'm not saying that there might not be some that came in at 25 or some that are at 75, but they are expensive propositions uh, for annual conferences and typically call on an annual conference to spend reserves to accommodate them. Bishop, we have another general conference in May of 2020. Can the actions of general conference 2019 be overturned at that time? I, the, 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 the delegates to the 2020 General Conference, which mostly have not been elected yet, uh, will have the right to take the actions that they deem, they deem fit. And uh, none of these actions um, that were approved at this General Conference uh, involved the constitution of the church, and, and they were all passed by uh, majority, by majority vote. Thank you. We have a question. Um, here that asks, can LGBTQ people serve the church in the areas of lay leader, uh, music uh, leader? Can they teach confirmation and Sunday school? Absolutely. They, they can and they are uh, in real time at this very moment. Bishop, what do you say to young people who read the recent headlines and now want nothing to do with the United Methodist Church? Whatever I say, um, I, I want to say it with great humility and patience when I have the privilege of engaging in those conversations, and I've had a, had a few since the General Conference. Um, and, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging to help any of us, but may be more true for the young, but I don't know that to a certainty, to separate the work of institutions and the hearts of individuals. Um, but I want to be inviting uh, to invite people to be able to see the nuance and distinguish that. Uh, many of us, we, in one sense, all of us act differently in a crowd than we do when left purely to our own about something. Um, and you, you will know the example that's true for you. The second thing, while it's not a bomb, is that all of us um, sometimes have to take a sobering look at uh, history and that the arc of history, um, and particularly with regard to change, is, um, um, is, is long sometimes, and, and it tries our, our souls. Um, so, uh, as has been said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The question is, in that arc, where are we as United Methodists right now? Bishop, a pastor has written in, my church aligns with the WCA, but as a pastor, I do not. What are my options for meaningful ministry among people who want to move forward? 
Well, obviously, every, every uh, itinerant pastor has uh, the opportunity to uh, indicate if they would prefer to have a different pastoral charge. Um, and it would, I would say it would depend on the relationships that that pastor may have with the people that he or she is serving at this time. Um, some of the people in congregations who uh, feel uh, affinity uh, with the WCA um, are not necessarily trying to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. So I want to be more patient in leaping to a conclusion that because a particular organization, caucus, or tribe uh, says here are our convictions, that number one, it's true for everybody in that local church, and number two, that um, they want to take the dramatic action of disaffiliation. So what what the support we can give to that pastor and that congregation is to discern what's the core of ministry. What do you believe you can do together? And, and can your sense of team be enriched and move forward together um, more by staying together and focusing on the mission? Or will all of your time be spent in sorting out your own sense of agreement and disagreement with one another about a small slice? Bishop, could there be a process for central conferences to become autonomous conferences like Mexico? Uh, that, that process exists. I mean, the discipline already outlines how that, how that might happen. So the answer is yes, there could be. Will you as bishop support the traditional plan if uh, found constitutional during the judicial review process in April, starting in 2020. So let me answer that in two ways. I'm not supporting any plan. My obligation at my consecration, and anybody in here can look on uh, in the book of worship and look at the vows of consecration, I made a vow to, um, to uphold um, the discipline uh, and to implement the discipline. I have no current plans uh, not um, to do that, um, but I also will be very wise and uh, judicious um, in how I go about that uh, should that should that actually be what ends up in our in our book of discipline. I do think that the book of discipline uh, at many places has lots of room for interpretive implementation. Someone wrote in should LGBTQ clergy and candidates for ministry be afraid of witch hunts? Not from me. What are other chargeable offenses other than those based on human sexuality? Mm. Um, chargeable offenses, all of which can be found in paragraph 2702 of the Book of Discipline, um, include uh, crime, uh, include a racial, uh, sexual harassment, um, a lot of which you see in, in the news and in TV. Um, it is um, um, teaching doctrines that are not doctrines of the United Methodist Church, um, uh, disobedience to the discipline of the church. There's a whole litany of um, chargeable offenses um, in, in the book of discipline. So, for example, um, someone who's ordained uh, who refuses to administer the sacraments of our church, um, I would consider that a chargeable offense uh, if someone brought a complaint against it. Um, I'm not soliciting that or suggesting that. I am illustrating it is the failure of that particular clergy person to do what they said they would do in their ordination. Bishop, other conferences have had similar simulcasts and gatherings. Um, what are you hearing from your colleagues across uh, the connection? Hmm. A lot of them are going on this weekend, and uh, I did uh, listen to one yesterday that was recorded from uh, another annual conference. A um, couple of things. Um, we, it, it feels like we've all tried to do it similarly, though I can say there was no template or cookie cutter because we wanted to contextualize it. Um, but in every case, um, there was a reporting out of um, the actions, hopefully in a sober way. Secondly, all the bishops that uh, I'm aware of that are doing this or will be doing Doing this in the days and weeks to come, um, have offered some opinions and observations. You can't unsee what you have seen, and um, 
Um, while I'm called to be fair and judicious, I've not been asked as a Christian, as a bishop, as a United Methodist, not to uh, have an opinion about some things. Um, the thing I want to remind people is I'm a United Methodist. I happen to have a particular job, but I am a member of the United Methodist Church, and uh, therefore it matters uh, to me uh, and outcomes. Uh, I've not heard any bishops who are saying that they have not experienced, observed, held, heard, or felt pain uh, in the body. Body that is their annual conferences. So this feels similar to what I'm hearing um, out there by way of questions. Bishop, do you know what will come of the request for an ethical investigation into the General Conference 2019 vote influence? Yeah, there was a, a reference to the Ethics Committee of the General Conference uh, about whether or not there were um, attempts to manipulate people to vote in particular ways uh, in exchange for something. And um, so um, I hope it will be taken seriously. I have no accusation to make. I simply hope that it will be taken seriously uh, so that all of the whole church can have a sense of a clean slate where that's concerned. Uh, secondly, I hope that um, whoever are the implementers of that, that ethics committee, that they will have appropriate training, resourcing, and support to do the work well, and uh, that they will have a clear plan of communication um, as to um, um, their findings. Bishop, these are all questions and responses that are at, at one kind of level. But here's a question that uh, goes a little deeper. My heart aches, my spirit is broken. What advice, what encouragement do you have for me? These are, these are platitudes, but they are not, to me, innocuous. Um, my encouragement is what I speak to myself, I think, which is uh, to hold on to see what the end will be. I think anyone in West Ohio knows that um, I'm no stranger to um, the way in, you, you, you're not, it's not strange to you that I am reassured by scripture and also by song. And uh, one of the songs that came to my mind during these days um, was um, one that I've heard um, people in pain sing, Courage, my soul, and let us journey on. Though the night be dark, it won't be very long. Thanks be to God, the morning light appears, and the storm is passing over. So we're in the middle of a storm, if that's a metaphor. I have every confidence that the storm will pass over. Now, here, here's the other side of that metaphor is there is always recovery responder work to do after every storm. And a part of the way in which my own heart heals from institutional pain is to participate in the rebuilding of something new and something better, which is why I invite young and not so young to stay engaged. If you want a new church, if you want a different church, a church with uh, different outcomes, then you've got to stay um, engaged. I don't, I'm not naive that that's not a challenge more for some than for others. Bishop, we've, we've received several questions around your personal uh, uh, mission and ministry going forward. I don't know if you're prepared to answer uh, fully today, but does the outcome of this special session affect your timeline for retirement? <laughs> well, um, tell the questioners, uh, why don't they speak directly into the microphone and uh, <laughs> tell me what they want to know. Um, at, at this point, um, I've not made that determination. My wife, Cynthia, who's here this morning, we've not had that specific conversation. Um, I've been very transparent with um, uh, everybody, um, and particularly with the Episcopacy Committee of the annual conference, um, and there are members of that committee here this morning, that, you know, I have the privilege, as many of us do in the Western world, in America in particular, that, you know, at mid-60s, of thinking about retirement. So I want to be honest and say, I've thought about it completely apart from any general conference. 
may I say tongue in cheek, but I mean this sincerely, when you get three mailings a day about Medicare supplement plans, <laughs> you're thinking about it. So I'm being as honest with you as I can. So I, I'd be lying and blowing smoke in your direction to say I don't think about it. And, um, um, but my personal timeline has not been affected, but I've already been thinking about is 2020 my year or is 2024? Now in 2024, I have no choice. So by, by the law of the church, I age out. So my options have narrowed from the time that I was first elected. The real choice is, you know, is it going to be in 2020 um, or, heaven forbid, to retire off cycle, which occasionally people do for reasons of health or to care for a loved one or something like that. So at this point, it has not affected it. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in right now, and, um, and I am grateful. I'm grateful to the church, to West Ohio, even a church um, that sometimes um, breaks the hearts of people. I'm still, I'm still grateful that, that God and the United Methodist Church ever asked me to serve. Bishop, a few people have asked the question, here in West Ohio, could we create two conferences? One allowing LGBTQ persons to marry and to uh, perform ministry, and another that would not. In this moment, I don't see how we would do that under the Book of Discipline. But I've never thought that question through, never had it posed to me. Bishop, what is your response to the jurisdictions that have already announced that they will defy the outcome of the general conference in 2019? Um, a lot of those people are my friends. I've got friends all over United Methodism, and um, I don't um, choose to express um, a sense of disappointment uh, with that kind of um, um, articulated defiance at, at, this, at this point. Um, I hope they will be wise um, and gentle. I also fully understand um, the contexts uh, out of which uh, they speak, and I don't have any uh, animus um, uh, toward them. In all of our decisions about how to navigate a storm, we all have to live with the reality that there are uh, intended and unintended messages and consequences. And that's true for everything. Everything, you know, somebody is going to scrutinize when they look at the tape of this, scrutinize every word I say, uh, said today, and um, either they'll, they'll cheer or they'll say, um, you know, he was completely wrong and um, was in defiance. And so we all have to take ownership for our, our decisions. And I do believe those people have uh, taken that sense of ownership. What none of us can completely control is the outcomes. Yeah. Bishop, this has not been easy for any of us. And yet, as we watched you on Tuesday morning lead us through that process, and as you stand before us today, you seem to be grounded. How, tell us how you stay grounded. Mm. Well, I want to say that on Tuesday uh, in particular, uh, that it was really uh, um, uh, the strength of my family. Uh, my wife um, kind of got me ready to go, and um, as she does all the time, every day, and particularly uh, at conferences. So thank you, dear. And, um, and, and my kids were, were texting me. Um, and it was kind of, you know, just that kind of encouragement. You can do it, Dad. You'll do a great job, Dad. We love you, Dad. And um, that means the world. The colleagues, um, they're, in spite of the fact that there are obviously differences of opinion in the Council of Bishops, uh, there is no bishop who wants the bishop in the chair to flunk. I can tell you that. They, we want that person. We see ourselves together. And if you listened to my comments when I took the chair, it was, I, I preside in behalf of the whole. And you don't want the bishop to fail. And I hope in the annual conference, you don't want the bishop to fail when he or she, in this case, he is in the chair, because it just creates chaos. 
And even if the mistakes are out of uh, nervousness, they still create chaos. So I don't, it doesn't mean it's a judgment against you. So the assurance of love of family, uh, my dad was, uh, who'll be 94 in a couple weeks, was in Philadelphia online in his apartment praying. <laughs> um, and um, um, some of my sisters-in-law were tuned in. And every one of those bishops, I am confident, whispered a prayer, um, you know, help Greg um, to do an effective job for the body uh, today. We really do try to get out of ourselves and say, let's help the body do what it wants to do and help them to do it well. Um, thirdly, and this is too long an answer, um, but what else is new? Um, you know, um, I, I, was, I was rehearsing scriptures, songs, and prayers in my head the whole time, and occasionally the ensemble um, were just picking up on my spirit. So when, when without suggestion, when they, when they hit, uh, we'll understand it better by and by, uh, by Charles Albert Tinley, uh, I could no longer resist uh, singing. Bishop, we've received another 150 questions beyond the 200. And, so that's 350? Uh, uh, well... <laughs> And they are still coming in, and we just want to let people know out across the conference that we will do our best to yes. respond to those questions. And uh, our suggestion is to stay in touch with our website. Right. We have one more question okay. for you uh, before we close and pray today. How can our West Ohio annual conference look differently than general conference and work toward healing these wounds? Number one, we have to want to look different. Um, and then we've got to find some agreement about um, the um, uh, behaviors as well as the environment that helps us to live into the difference or the change that we want to see or that we want, uh, we want to be. Um, I would, um, I'm inviting myself and all of you in West Ohio uh, to be attentive um, to, to, to simple things, but things that have been reiterated over and over to us um, in scripture. Um, you know, some attention to what um, love looks like if you, if, if you look at that litany in Galatians of the fruit of the spirit. Um, so, you know, you, you, you know, it's kind of tough to say I love you and you're shouting at someone. <laughs> and so maybe the fruit, um, you know, that's why it's, it has these other pictures in it, even though um, love is in the list, patience, kindness, um, et cetera. Um, so I hope um, we will, um, we have a narrative, we have a script, we have resources, and sometimes we're always looking somewhere else other than to our primary resources um, to uh, enrich uh, our life in Christ and our life um, in, uh, in community. And so um, if we will be the people who will be prayerful and care, uh, as in full of care, careful, um, I think God can work with us. And that doesn't mean we're going to all start singing the same tune. <laughs> Uh, simultaneously. It means that we will not dishonor the image of God in every person or group, and we will not discount them as somehow or another not being really a Christian. And that's why I want us to engage in um, a vigorous study of a plain account of Christian perfection. Bishop, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for this privilege.